Hi, thanks everyone. And thank you, Fiona. And thank you, Nicole, for that fantastic uh, talk just then. It really got me thinking, why are we actually here? And, and for me, I feel like I'm here because I'm essentially standing on the shoulders of so many fantastic designers and developers who've come before me. And we're part of such a, an amazing community who, who open source their code and, and share with one another. So I'm really appreciative of everyone who, who put this thing together today. And if we could just put our hands together for the people who actually just put this on once again. So today, I'm going to be talking to you about how you can bring elements of surprise and delight to your projects and to your websites. And to do that, we're going to be using two technologies, SVG and CSS. And mainly the thing that we're going to be doing today is really talking about how you can use SVG today, how you can bring it into your projects. And just to show of hands, who's actually using any form of SVG in their projects? So it's quite a lot of you. And of you, how many of you are using inline SVG in your projects? So it's a, well, it's a much smaller number. That's good. Um, I'm hoping that I can actually learn something from you after I give you this talk, because I'm, I'm interested in, in your perspectives on how this works. But I'm also hoping to teach you a little bit and show you some things that I've experienced. I'm by no means an expert in this, but I've experimented a lot with SVG and CSS. So hopefully, I can give you something today. But what we won't be talking about is frameworks. And I'm not saying don't use frameworks, because the frameworks that are there, such as Snap, are fantastic. And I encourage you to explore them. But it's also important to, I guess, understand what these frameworks are doing for you, so you can actually make an informed decision of whether you actually need them or not, or whether you might just need to put a little bit of JavaScript in there to do what you need to do. So today, we'll be exploring a few things. We'll be exploring why you'd want to use SVG and CSS in your projects. So we'll be exploring things like storytelling. We'll be talking about you know, how, how you can enhance storytelling with SVG and CSS. We'll also be talking about things like uh, lessons from the past and how we've typically brought animation to the web and what our attitudes were. I mean, we, we had Flash a long time ago, and we went kind of bonkers with Flash. And, and the attitudes that come out of us doing things like that, and how that harms both the user and ourselves. And we'll talk about what's actually possible with SVG and CSS. And for the things that aren't too possible, maybe I'll show you some fallbacks, some ways in which we can deal with, with uh, when, when SVG and CSS don't play so well together. So to begin, I'm going to talk about why you'd want to use it. And that's essentially to enhance storytelling. And what I really mean is something that uh, Donald Norman really brought to me, brought to my attention in his book, Emotional Design, is one thing that he said was, it's not enough that we build products that function, that are understandable and usable. We also need to build products that bring joy and excitement. And essentially what we're trying to do there is we're trying to humanize the machine. Because we can present data and content in a certain way, and it's usable, and it's there. But we can also make it more lively and exciting. And so we see these examples on the web of storytelling that enhance uh, the, the, con the content and the presentation of that content. One example I saw recently, well, in the last six months, was the Polygon example. The surprise and delight in this and the storytelling in this is, is a way of showing the design of the, of the objects. And it's not, not done in a way in which it becomes annoying and in your way. It's something that you could ignore if you, didn't want to, if you didn't want to participate in it, and it's something that adds value to what you're looking at. And so that's its way of storytelling. And then we have, say, SVG and CSS and animation used together to do things like use as activism. So we've got storytelling as activism. And so you're going through, and you're interacting with this experience that's showing you uh, an important issue. 
And who has Fitbit here? Anyone? Anyone use a Fitbit? So there's a couple of you. So dashboards are a great example of storytelling. And a dashboard is showing you essentially the progress in which you've made. And in Fitbit's example, it's what you've been doing that particular week. And that particular week, I didn't do a lot of exercise, as you can see. And then you have these stories that the New York Times has been presenting. And the, the kind of story, the way they've been enhancing their storytelling is, is really interesting. And so they've, they've, in this particular one, they're going through a journey and they're taking you through the map of this journey from St. Petersburg to Moscow. And they're sort of plotting away the journey on the side here to the left. And they're using that as a way to enhance and to, to sort of show you along the way that these photos have a context. And then it, once again, it doesn't get in the way. It's a way of just enhancing something. But when we talk about these things, we need to think about the past because our prevailing attitude in the past was essentially this. It's like, bring flash, animate all the things. And so we really need to consider the experience impact of our choices. We need to think about how what we do affects the people who actually have to use it, not just having these self-indulgent websites so where we could do it just because we could do it. And how many of us have experienced this? You go to a website, you want to read an article, you want to find out about a product, and you're sitting there and you're waiting. Websites, some websites still do this today. And it's surprising that people will make you, will actually believe that you're going to sit there and wait through these things. It'd have to be pretty bloody good for me to want to wait through, oh, it's going in reverse. It'd have to be pretty bloody good for me to want to actually wait for some of these things. And so many times I've abandoned websites for that exact reason. And the more modern problem I come across these days is the scroll hijack. And it's more difficult for me to show you on this slide, but just say I wanted to scroll really fast to the bottom, it's not letting me. It's taken over my scrolling experience. And I've got a mental model of how a website scrolls, and everyone has that mental model. And it's stealing that from me, and it's making me frustrated. So we also have to think about another thing, the performance impact of our choices. And there are websites all over the internet. Apple's a famous example of this, where they're throwing 356 HTTP requests at you and 25 meg just to tell you about a product. I feel like it's a little bit self-indulgent. Another website I came across on Sidebar one day had 200 meg. If I'd used my phone to, this, to use this, my, my phone, that would be one-fifth of what my phone is allowed to do each month. So before we talk about the techniques that I'm going to show you, I would just want to leave you with the thought of do no harm. Because it's not just doing no harm to the users that are using our websites, that are using these experiences, but it's also doing no harm to us. Because every time we do do these things, every time we take over the experience, or we put something ahead of the thing that people actually want, we end up harming ourselves because people's attitudes towards having the animation in the website or having this interesting visual component in the website starts to become negative. They start to associate it with, oh, we don't want that, we don't want that. And then you're going to have a much harder time convincing people to allow that. So in part three, I'm going to let you in on a world of pleasure and pain. And that world of pleasure and pain is SVG and CSS implementation. It is a road fraught with danger, but I will be telling you, I will be holding your hand along the way and I will be telling you some ways around some things. And some of the ways of dealing with those things are going to be a little bit crude, but what I wanted to do today is to try and help you put CSS and SVG together and allow you to use, say, inline SVG in your projects. One of the great things about SVG, it has a very similar mental model to how you would do things today. The CSS, the styles that I would apply to SVG are very similar to the styles that I'd apply to HTML. There's slight differences. I mean, instead of a border, you might have a stroke. And that stroke has a few more extra options that you can, su you can supply um, the style. 
such as you can put these dash arrays and dash offsets, you can put uh, line joins, and you can control how the actual lines hook up. And the animation with keyframes is essentially exactly the same. But there is all that markup. And when you see a screen like this, you open your, your, your uh, HTML file and you're using inline SVG and you see something like this and it makes you not want to use it because what is all that anyway? I mean, there's probably a few people in this room who actually know what the M and the Z and all that mean, but I, I expect not many people would. But we can make it more dry. Oleg Selemka had a great article in November last year and he was talking about the idea of templating the SVG. So what the idea of this is, is you're actually setting a definition of what that object is, and then you're using it again later. So as an example, use your favorite vector program, whatever that is. For me, it's Illustrator, because I'm old. Here's a smiley face. You then get it to export that smiley face, and as you, as you see here, we've got a definition. That's the code that would be exported for the smiley face. So it's not important what the code is here, just that it's within a definition and that we've already templated what a smiley face is. And all we need to do is put this code in and that will then reference that smiley face. Of course, we would put that within an SVG. And then you have two smiley faces, smiles all around. Now, in theory, SVG is accessible. In the spec, it says you can put a title, you can put a description against things, and it will make it more accessible. And so you think, okay, I'll get my project and I've got a bar chart, and I'll put a, a title in there, and I'll describe what it's actually doing. And then I might put a title on each bar in the bar chart. It seems easy, right? Mm. It's not so easy, it's not so true. Uh, at the moment, the access accessibility of SVG isn't that great, unfortunately. It feels good to put that title and description in, it feels like you're doing more than an image alt tag, but the voice, the voice uh, screen readers don't really respect that so much. And so you might only find Firefox NVDA will pick up some of the things like ARIA roles and it will work in Internet Explorer, but you won't find it working so well with, say, VoiceOver for Mac or Chromebox. And I don't uh, test with JAWS because I don't have a whole lot of money to buy JAWS, but all the, all the voice programs that I use don't respect uh, ARIA roles so much. So I have a for now solution for that. First thing, you do want to put an ARIA role on it um, as a good practice. That will say that it's an image, and you want to label it by title and description, so Firefox and Internet Explorer in NVDA will actually respect it. And for all the other browsers, I'll actually put something on a wrapper that just says what it is, a graphical representation of a donation spend. There is some hope with accessibility in SVG, and that is with SVG2. And we'll have better tab index support, and we'll have better um, ARIA labels. SVG is also responsive, and there's two ways in which you can approach it being responsive. The first is the proportional way. So I can grab this and I can just make it switch at different breakpoints. Um, for this example, I'm just, I've just thrown in a few devices that I've made with SVG and that it can switch really easily. And what th this way will do is this way will actually um, scale the object. And just like before, um, a media query with an SVG is essentially the same as what you're used to. Um, and I do it within the elements, so that's, that's a different discussion. Um, uh, there's also something in SVG called Viewbox, um, and you'll find that Viewbox is a little confusing. And really, Viewbox, the important thing is that the first two numbers are just a coordinate of X and Y, so where it is on the X and Y plane. And the second two numbers are actually a way in which it can tell what the proportion of the stuff within it is. So having a higher number will mean that it's actually much smaller, and having a, a, a lower number will mean that it's much wider. 
There's also one other thing that you need to know about with uh, Viewbox, and that's something called preserve aspect ratio. And all that is doing is it's telling it where to scale from. So if you use something like X mid, that means that it scales from the middle of the X plane. And if you use Y min, that means it's scaling from the top. Now you'll find when you're working with SVG, you'll have a little problem in Firefox. You'll see that all the other browsers will be quite fine with you having this SVG, and, and we'll show you the whole SVG. But Firefox will cut it off for some reason. But before you get mad at Firefox for doing it, it's actually doing what the spec says it should be doing. It's supposed to be overflow hidden by default. It's just that the other browsers don't listen to that for some reason. So to deal with that, you just need to put overflow visible on that um, SVG element. And so you'll get something fixed. Now the other way in which I would do responsive with SVG is I would have a fixed element. And so when you have a fixed element, it doesn't scale proportionally, but it changes with the media query. An example of when you would use that was something like a donut chart, and if you could imagine I had some text to the side of that, and I then wanted that text to then be at the bottom. SVG is relatively device and browser friendly, but we've had some slow implementation. If you look at can I use, you'll see no Internet Explorer 8 and below, no Android 2. With SMIL, which is one of the things that you really want to do with, uh, with SVG, unfortunately, no Internet Explorer um, at all. So all those really interesting things inside SVG, you, that's when you'll probably want to use a framework. So just to quickly recap, if you want to use SVG at all, no Android 2, no Internet Explorer 8 and below. So I've got some fallbacks which will make you feel kind of dirty. So one is using Modernizer to check for inline SVG. And if there's no SVG, I'll simply replace it with a background like it was if it was a background SVG. And the code, sample of code for that is just simply looking for the feature. Modernizer will chuck the, uh, chuck the class on there, and then I'll give it a PNG. Now, there's a number of issues with SVG animation that you need to be aware of. And just as an example, I was messing around with a hamburger style menu. And I came to the realization while I was doing that, that in Chrome, so for this example, it's just scaling one in, out and one in. And in Chrome, it does exactly as I told it to do. When I hover it, I want the hamburger to go down, and I want the X to come up. And you'd think, yep, that's fine, Safari, it's fine. Go into Firefox, and you have a slight issue. Firefox won't accept transform center center or any kind of word-based transform, and it won't allow you to put percentages in. Firefox will always anchor to the top left, which is really, really bad for animation, because you want to be able to control that. And in IE, it doesn't even accept transform at all, and as you can see, I don't even get three bars out of that. And the only thing you can actually animate in Internet Explorer, even up to Internet Explorer 11, as far as I know, is opacity. So I've got a little bit of a workaround. This is Internet Explorer 10. I managed to get the SVG to animate. Can anyone guess as to how I might have done that? Yep. Very close. Okay, so I'll just quickly go through. So, oh yeah, uh, so you said you transform the wrapper? Okay, yes, that's very, very close. It's pretty much it. So you go in your favorite graphics program and you make your weird pattern thing that you're gonna animate. And then you make your path, which comes out of it. And you put that within a definition, and that's a template. And that thing is its own SVG. You then make a stage with a wrapper. And then you set the limits to that wrapper. So you're telling it that it can't be outside of a certain area. And then you put those objects on the stage, using that templating thing that we talked about before. Except in this case, we're using small SVGs, and we're referencing the other SVG. 
And so you, now you've got two waves. You might not be able to see it because I have a wall of code here, but in the view box, I've actually adjusted the first two numbers. And that's just so that they can layer over each other. So just to quickly recap, we have our wrapper. We then put our stage, and that stage is deliberately outside of the wrapper. And because for some reason, Chrome and Safari don't like to uh, respect the boundaries that we've actually set, you actually have to bleed it out of it a little bit, which is hacky and gross, I know, but it's a workaround. And then you layer all three SVGs on top of each other. And then you can just use a position absolute, and then you can transform each of those elements as though using normal CSS animation. So you're not relying on the implementation of CSS and animation within SVG, you're actually relying on the standard implementation of CSS animation. And of course, you want to find, put a common class, and like I said, position absolute on the layer, and we've got uh, going outside of that um, boundary. And you style each wave, and put an animation on each uh, wave, and then once again, you have your animation. So SVG is fairly designer friendly, and as, as I explained before, you can just go in whatever vector program you like and export crazy robots. You can do complex shapes. So it's great for doing things like type lockups and sort of line sort of things and shapes that you can layer on top of each other and use various opacity that you wouldn't normally be able to do with CSS. And it's great for data visualization. And so you can have all the infographic stuff for those people that foam at the mouth at infographics. And the great thing about it is that you can then interact with that stuff programmatically. But you can't interact with an SVG as image on the page, as far as I know, other than actually moving that around using traditional animation. And you can't really interact with the background image in the same way. SVG, SVG has some pretty promising features. And one of my favorites is actually clipping and masking. So just to quickly explain what clipping and masking is, for those of you who might not know what that is, is first we have a hexagon. And then we want to put a clip path over the top of that hexagon. And what that clip path is essentially doing is saying that this hexagon can only exist within that clip path. Well, actually exists out of it, but you can only be seen within that clip path. And then finally, that clip path will then be shown within that boundary. And I made a little example of a tree using that that grows. It's just a, a quick example of the tree trunk growing up using something like that. And all it is doing is animating the clip path up so it doesn't all just scale up in a really weird way. And I'll show you what it looks like without the clip path with the cliff path behind it. Okay. First, yeah, we put the example clip path in, and then we, uh, then we apply the style of the clip path to that particular graphical element. Here's the example I was mentioning before. This is what it would look like without the clip path, and with the clip path behind it. As you can see, it scales up in a really weird way, and then you see this big purple thing. That big purple thing is the shape that I'm essentially animating behind it. So SVG also has really interesting filters. An example of how not to do the filters, don't go into something like Illustrator and add drop shadow, because then you'll end up with something that looks a bit like this. And you don't really want something like this in your code. It looks kind of gross. And the reason why not only is this kind of gross is this is actually rasterized. So this is actually removing the benefit of having a vector, uh, vector format in your code because it's chucking this huge lot of rasterized stuff into your actual shape. To give you an example of a complex drop shadow, I had to make this a really ugly drop shadow for this presentation, by the way. <laughs> I'm not saying this is how you should do your drop shadows. Um, is you can actually put these drop shadows on these complex items, which you couldn't really do with box shadow. Box shadow would just put a shadow around the box. So to give you a quick example of how you would do that is once again, you use those definitions that we talked about. So the great thing about SVG is that little templating thing. You can put things in defs, and they won't render out unless you're actually using them. So in this one, we put a little Gaussian blur 
on the, uh, on the drop shadow, and you can change that standard deviation number, and that'll let you actually um, change the strength of that drop shadow. And then you'd set sort of an offset blur, and that would tell you how far it is from there. And then the rest of the stuff there is just the extra implementation of that. And you can do things like, you can put noise, and I'm not sure if I can actually, you can actually see that from where you are, but you can put noise over the top of things, like a gradient. And to do that, you'd use a noise filter, and that would then filter over red, green, and blue, and then you'd desaturate it so it doesn't uh, affect the colors of what you're actually using, and then you'd just put that over the top of an actual gradient, and you'd make that sort of opaque. My favorite thing in SVG is type along a path. And we have all these examples of the web of art direction cases where people use curved type in an interesting way. And it's something I really wish we could just do with HTML and CSS. But to do it with HTML and CSS, it's a bit of a dark art. It's, uh, yeah, it's the dark art of curved type. So someone might approach it like this, they might put a span around every single letter, and then position every single letter out in a way in which that could have that effect. Or you might use something like lettering.js, which essentially does the same thing. How to create that in SVG? Once again, we use that def thing, which is pretty, pretty handy. And that path there is essentially this. I got, a semi I got a circle, I cut it in half, and then I exported the path. To actually have that text, I get to put the word in that I actually put in. So it makes it a lot easier to work with. And that's now referencing the X link there in the middle, is referencing that text shape, which is the curve. And then I'm giving it an offset. I'm telling it to go start halfway through that shape. I'm then telling it to anchor from the middle, so the text will actually flow out from that middle area. And you'll end up with something like that. So it's text over a curve. And you think, fantastic. Except then Firefox comes along, and it looks like it looks like a car hit it. And of course, you respond accordingly to that, and you want a Hulk smash. So I've got a less than ideal workaround for dealing with this, and I have actually managed to work with a few paths, and I haven't quite figured out what the actual pattern is. But sometimes it doesn't do that in Firefox. But it seems the problem is to do with the offset. So. In this particular example, I found an offset percentage which didn't make the text look like it had been hit by a truck. And here's where, here's where the really ugly solution comes in. I then transform the entire SVG object <laughs> to, to be rotated in a way in which I can then get a fairly consistent experience for the curve. And it's not quite exactly the same as how I'd done it, but uh, it, still, it still looks moderately how I want it to, to look. So let's talk about line animation. And you, you, as I showed you the polygon example earlier, um, I was really impressed by that. And I'm not saying that you should all just suddenly put line animations on your website, but I just wanted to talk about how, actually, how easily that implementation is. So start with something like a microphone, and you've got this thick outer line, you've got thin, thin lines inside it, and you export that into paths. And I'm not going to show you all the paths because there's quite a few of them. But what I did through this is I found common paths. So I found that inside there's a, there's a skinny line. On the outside, it's got a thick line. And it's got some blocks of color. The key to the animation is actually with that stroke dash offset I said earlier and stroke dash array. Now, I'll just quickly explain what they actually are. Dash array essentially says with the first number, I'm the dash. So that's 100 pixels wide. And then the second number is I'm the gap in the dash. And so that one might be 200 pixels wide. And dash offset actually tells it when the pattern begins. So if I made it 500, it would start beginning at 500. And when we animate, in this example, for the microphone, I made it 2,000 pixels. And then I animate that 2,000 pixels down to zero. And then we get something when this actually loads the page that draws the animation onto there, and then I just fade in the rest of the elements. So what I want you to think, take from this and think about is how you can use SVG. And once again, the frameworks that are there are fantastic, and I think you should ex explore them. But it's definitely worth 
exploring what you can do with SVG today because it's a surprising amount that you can actually do. And it's a way of enhancing things on your, in your projects and a way of enhancing storytelling in your projects because you can do things like animate complex shapes. You can add curves. You can add all these little effects that don't necessarily intrude on the experience but enhance the experience. So thank you very much.